Hello folks, my name is Lucas Mann. I'm the pastor of the Spring Church, just a church probably about 15 minutes from here in Lawrence County. And friends, I come here to the rest area to preach the gospel of grace, to tell people about Jesus Christ, to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world. The Apostle Paul said himself in Romans 1.16 that he was not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And friends, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is God's power unto salvation for all who believe it, who believe that the Lord Jesus Christ reigns as King of the universe. For those who believe the gospel, they are in the children of God. They are the sons and the daughters of the Most High. To those who have received Christ as their Savior, who have received Him as Lord, who have embraced the Gospel, they have been saved from their sin. They've been born again. They have been given the gift of eternal life in Him. And so friends, I come to bring that message of eternal life in Jesus Christ. To call out sin, yes. To tell the bad news, yes. To tell you the fact that you have sinned against God. You deserve His punishment for sin. You deserve, you deserve hell. But God in His mercy sent forth His Son to propitiate, to satisfy His wrath so sinners could enter into heaven. So that sinful people could be in God's presence for all eternity. People who otherwise could not approach Him and could not stand in His presence. God has put forth the Savior, Jesus Christ, as the only Savior. He has come into the world to save sinners. Jesus Himself said in Luke 19.10, He said, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. People are lost outside of Christ. Lost without any hope. Without any hope in and of themselves. Without any, without any way of salvation. But Jesus Christ has come into the world to save those who are lost. He seeks out. There is one seeker and it is Christ who seeks out the lost and saves them from their sins. In fact, in, Ma in uh, Matthew chapter 1, the angel told Joseph in a vision before Jesus was even born, he said, you shall call his name Jesus, which means Yahweh saves, for he will save his people from their sins. And so the text of Scripture I would like to direct your attention to this afternoon is that of Romans. In Romans chapter 1, verses 29 through 31, and this is what the Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, wrote. He said, and he's speaking here in this verse, he's speaking of those who are outside of Christ. In fact, I will read verse 28 to give us some context. He says, And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper, being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. And then in verse 32 it says, And although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. But I specifically want to direct your attention, as I said a moment ago, to verses 29 through 31, which speaks to those who are outside of Christ. It speaks to those who are lost in their sin. This is the state of those who reject the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is the state of all mankind, even myself, outside of the saving, redeeming grace of God. Man is not inherently good. People are not inherently righteous. There is nothing good in me. There is nothing good in you. 
all mankind together. Doesn't matter where you are from or what the color of your skin is or how much money you make or what place in society you have or how high up in political ranks you might find yourself to be. All people are in this very same camp. They are in this position that these verses describe. Filled with all unrighteousness and evil. Perverse. Depraved to the uttermost. That's why verse 28 actually says, God gave them over to a depraved mind. Not only is the mind depraved, but every aspect of man, every faculty that he has is utterly corrupt to the uttermost. His will is only to do sin continually. He sins against God day in and day out. And he cares not that he does so. People are not intrinsically good. Their hearts are not intrinsically good either. People say, well, God knows my heart. God knows that my intentions are correct and that my intentions are to do good and to do right. Sometimes I may make mistakes. Sometimes I may sin. But my my intentions are right. And therefore, people will instruct one another oftentimes. They will say, follow your heart. Follow your heart. But what does the Scripture say? What does God's Word, what does the authoritative Word of God say? Well, Jeremiah 17, 9 reads, The heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. And then it asks this question. It says, Who can understand it? Listen to verse 10. I, this is God speaking, I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give to each man according to his ways, according to the results of his deeds. And we know from the previous verse that the, that the heart is desperately wicked. It is, it is utterly evil. In fact, it, as, as we just read, it, it asks the question, who can understand how wicked man's heart is? That's why Jesus had to come to save sinners from this lost state. To save sinners from this, this state of depravity and this hostility toward God. See, there is no neutrality with Jesus Christ. He Himself said in His ministry, you are either for Me or you're against Me. Friends, you're either for the glory of God or you're, you're an enemy of God seeking to annihilate His rule and annihilate His glory, which is a futile task and it will never be accomplished. You were either God's friend or you were God's enemy and there is no neutral ground. Many of you are the enemies of God. In fact, I know this from Scripture. Most people are the enemies of God. They're not friends with God. Jesus said many are on the road to destruction. Many are. Listen to what the way the book of Nahum, Nahum chapter 1, describes man's futile attempts to resist the authority of God. Nahum 1.9 says, Whatever you devise against Yahweh, He will make a complete end of it. Distress will not rise up twice. God is at war with the sinner, and the sinner is at war with God. But God has offered peace. God has offered terms of peace in the Gospel of peace, the Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is a message of peace. In fact, we see ourselves in a day and age and in a culture, people are at war with one another. Even our own nation, there's so much tension. Where can we find peace? Not through political endeavors. Not through economic enhancement. But through the gospel of peace. And I'm not speaking just in, the, in relation to peace between men. I'm talking about peace with God. How do we have peace with God? That's the greatest question one can ask. How can I have peace with God? But how you can have peace with God is through Jesus Christ. Through the Gospel of Jesus Christ. In fact, the Bible calls the Gospel the Gospel of peace. 
Paul instructs the churches in Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 6 verse 15 he says and having showed your feet or excuse me having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace it's good news the gospel of peace is very very good news and that's the gospel I seek to preach to you even though the text we're looking at these three verses in Romans are it's, it's mostly bad news it all it all's bad news Describing man's lost state, it's just bad news. However, that will drive us to look at the good news. For we cannot understand the gospel message of Jesus Christ until we understand the depravity of our lost state. We understand how bad we truly are in the eyes of God and how sinful we are and how we have, we have rebelled against His authority and we're lost. We're lost eternally. We can only grasp the grace of God in so far as we have grasped the holy, righteous wrath of God. The wrath of God is being revealed, friends, against those who are ungodly and unrighteous. But the grace of God, likewise, is being revealed to those who are in Christ. So, friends, I encourage you, even now at the outset of this sermon, to believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved from your sins, to be reconciled to God through the death of His Son, for it costs God very much to purchase salvation for His people. So let us consider that great salvation that He has provided as we look at this passage and other passages throughout the Scriptures. To quickly note the context of this verse in Romans 1, Paul has established in verses 16 and 17 the book, the, the, the theme of the book of Romans, the thesis statement. In verse 16 he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. That's what the whole book is about. The gospel message, the good news of Jesus Christ. And then in verse 17 he says, For in it, and he's talking about the gospel there, for in the gospel the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written but the righteous man shall live by faith the 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 gospel message of Jesus Christ is that God will give you righteousness perfect righteousness by faith alone if you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ alone the grace of God alone so that God is glorified alone and then you'll be saved and God will give you righteousness but to understand why you need righteousness, why you need salvation, you have to first understand your sin. You have to understand your need for salvation. No doctor would go and tell his patients all of the treatment options for their various illnesses without first taking the time to explain to them, to explain to his patients the illnesses that they have, explaining to them the diseases that they are afflicted with, that could possibly take their lives and bring them to utter ruin. He first does that so that He can reveal to their, the, to, before their eyes, He can show them the treatment options and say, listen, you have this issue. You have this disease. It can kill you. You only have so much time to live. But listen, we have treatment options. There's treatment options. Every skillful, do skillful doctor first explains the bad news before he gives the good news. And so likewise, when it comes to the gospel of Jesus Christ, it's the same way. It's a remedy. It's a cure to the disease that we have. To this horrible dilemma we find ourselves caught in. But we first have to understand the dilemma. The horror of our sin and the, the, the holy justice of God. The righteous wrath of God. And that is precisely where Paul begins his explanation of the gospel message in verse 18. The next verse he says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. That is what he begins explaining First and foremost, he wants to put this at the outset because this needs to be the first thing that a sinner understands is that they've sinned against God and they deserve His wrath.
And so he continues as the verses roll on one after another, explaining to the reader the lost state of someone who is outside of Christ. And it's a hopeless state. It's a hopeless state. And that's why we find ourselves, as we just read in verse 18, that it says, And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper. And then we find ourselves focusing in on verse 29 through 31. So that's the context. Now we understand where Paul's coming from. Now let's consider these three verses here. The lost state. The state of those who are lost outside of Christ. He begins in verse 29. Or he, I should say continues on. He says, Being filled with all unrighteousness. That's present tense. They're being filled. Those who are outside of Jesus Christ are moving in the direction of further sinfulness. If you're outside of Christ, you're just moving in a direction of further sinfulness. People are not moving away from sin, but moving toward it because they're attracted to it. Their nature is attracted to it. To that which is evil and that which is sinful. That's why verse 29 says that. It says all unrighteousness. That would be the negative. Righteous, of course, would be the positive. That word simply means that which is right. That which is in accordance to the character and person of God. But sin is in contradiction to the character of God. That's what sin is. That which is against God's holy, perfect character. And so it says they're filled with all unrighteousness. All kinds, all sorts. You may not commit every sin on the face of the earth. I'm not saying that necessarily. But sinners around the world as a corporate whole are committing so many different kinds of sins. And the only Savior for sin is Jesus Christ. He's the only way. Oh, how I plead with you, my friends. Believe upon Him for, for eternal life, for eternal salvation. Don't die in your sins, but be saved through Christ. And then notice the next word, wickedness. They are wicked. You are wicked if you're outside of Christ. If you find yourself as an enemy of God and not a friend, you're certainly wicked. I am wicked, I know that. I know intrinsically, inherently, I am evil, depraved, corrupt to the core. I'm not saying these things as if I am better than you. No. Knowing I am actually worse than you. But I know that because I'm a great sinner does not negate the fact that Jesus Christ is a great Savior. It says, second, or thirdly, I should say, in this list, it says... Greed. And look at where we find ourselves in a society that is built around greed, materialism, love of money. People are worshipping at the feet of various things. They're greedy. They don't even want to share with their own family and friends. That's because they're lost and outside of Jesus Christ and they need to be saved from their sins. And it continues. It says greed and then it says evil. Evil. Man is not inherently good. Man is inherently evil. As the text itself reads. This is the, this is the Word of God. This is the authoritative Word of God. And it says man is inherently evil. Continuing, it says full of envy. And that's true, especially... I would say people in my generation, millennials, are very envious toward one another. If anybody has anything nice, a nice phone or a nice car, it is as if other millennials are so filled with envy, which is sinful. It's covetous. And then continuing, it says murder. Murder. How that is true. Even I'm just applying all this to our present society, our present culture. 
and the culture you find yourself in, we have a culture that is built on death. We have a culture that is built on murder. We have a culture that is built on the slaughter of innocent human beings. You may ask how. In America, every day, over 3,000 babies are killed in their mother's womb across America. Just this morning, I was at an abortion clinic in Greenville County, standing there pleading with the young women not to slaughter their children. It happens even in our own backyards, friends. Murder. Slaughtering of the innocent. It's true. The Scripture's true. Man is actually that evil that he would do that. You may say, well, I've never, I've never had an abortion. I've never committed murder. Well, my friends, Jesus said in Matthew 5, if you have anger in your heart towards someone else, towards your brother, towards your friend, towards your spouse, toward whoever, you are guilty as if you murdered. You are, you are on this equal plane as a murder. It is as if you murdered. God sees it the same. God sees your mind, friends. He sees your heart. And He sees that you are evil. Not pure. And not righteous. Unrighteous. It continues. The text reads, Strife. Deceit. Malice. Three things. Strife, deceit, and malice. People are filled with strife. And this plays off of what he had already written just a few words back concerning envy. They're full of envy. And out of that comes strife. And then it says deceit. People are deceitful. Just as I read out of Jeremiah 17.9, the heart is deceitful. The human heart is deceitful. You can be self-deceived, my friends. You can be self-deceived. The Word of God says there are many people who say they know Christ, but they are hypocrites. I see this all the time as a pastor. All the time. People are lost and people say they're Christians. People say they follow Jesus Christ, but they're hypocrites. I see it all the time. I myself, I was a hypocrite for many years. Eight years of false converts. Said I was a Christian. Said I was a follower of Christ. But I was lost. I was terribly lost in my sin. Until God truly saved me. It says deceit. And then it says malice. And then it says they are gossips. Do you gossip? Do you slander other people? That's a sin. That's a sin. And that shows your sinful nature. That shows the state in which you are outside of Christ. And that is why you need the Savior. You need Jesus Christ. He is the Lord. He is the one who can save from sin. He saves from both the power of sin and the effect of sin. The power being that we are in bondage to it and we will continue to live in it if God does not condescend in His grace to save us from it. And then in the power of sin, or excuse me, and then the effect of sin being hell. Hell is the result. When you sin before God, you earn your place in hell. But Jesus Christ saves from hell. So believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved from your sins. The text continues in verse 30. It says they are slanderers, which is very closely connected to gossip. They're sisters to one another. Do you slander other people? Do you speak ill of others? It's because you're lost. And it says, and this is something that is very important that you understand. Verse 30 says, after slanderers, it says, haters of God. People do not inherently seek after God. People do not inherently like God. People do not inherently even have a neutral position with God. They hate God. Those who are unconverted, who are lost and dead in their sin, they hate God. They are not seeking after God. They, have, they want nothing to do with Him. God seeks after the sinner, and He saves the sinner by His own power. How do I know this? Listen to Romans 3. Romans 3, verse 10. As it is written, There is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. 
Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of asps is under their lips. His mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths. And the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. That is how we know that there is no neutrality with Jesus Christ. If you're outside of Jesus Christ, you hate Him. And that is why you're outside of Him. Because you hate Him. And the only, way God, the only way your heart can go from hating God to adoring Christ and to following after Christ is through the radical work of the Holy Spirit. Is through the, the saving work of God. Believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved from your sins. For the grace of God has appeared. God has revealed His grace in His Son. And so I exhort and I plead with you to believe Him. It continues in verse 30. It says, insolent, arrogant. People are arrogant. They, they think they find themselves thinking that they know what they're talking about or they know they're good but they're actually ignorant the only difference between arrogance and ignorance is arrogance is you think you know but you do not ignorance is you know you do not know that's the only difference he says arrogant boastful people are boastful you know what the Bible says? Those who boast, those who boast in themselves will be resisted by God. But those who are humble, He receives those. He gives grace to those who are humble. Salvation is all of grace. Salvation is all of God's free grace in Jesus Christ so that, so that it brings glory to God and so that no one may boast. Ephesians 2, 8-9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Verse 30, it continues. It says they're inventors of evil. Inventors of evil. Look at our society, friends. We don't have to look far to find evidence for this truth. So much confusion about gender hysteria and homosexuality and promiscuity at young ages, fornication, adultery, pornography. Sexual perversion is all over the place. Not just sexual perversion though. Pridefulness, selfishness, lying. People lie all the time and don't give a don't care at all. They don't care at all that they've lied. They invent new ways to sin against God. And they invent new ways to sin against Him because they hate Him. See, you cannot come to Christ because you will not come to Christ. It's not you will not because you cannot. You cannot because you will not come to Jesus Christ. And it says disobedient to parents. That's true. Our society fosters rebellion. We've lost it. We have completely lost a sense in which people ought to obey their parents. Children are to submit to their parents. That's a biblical command. A biblical command to honor your parents. And yet here it says they are disobedient to parents. They're inventing new ways to sin against God. Inventing new ways to commit new kinds of evil. And then it says in verse 31, without understanding, untrustworthy. Those who are outside of Christ cannot understand the things of God. They cannot understand the gospel. See, I come out here knowing this, that if, if God is to save you, He must supernaturally act and move upon you and grant you understanding of the gospel. Otherwise, you will never understand it, for it is spiritually discerned. It is spiritually understood. The gospel is something that is a spiritual reality. It's not merely intellectual. 
That is a huge aspect of it, but it is also spiritual. It says untrustworthy. Those who are outside of Christ are so sinful, they're untrust. You cannot trust them. You cannot trust those who are outside of Christ. That's true. Their hearts are deceitful. They deceive themselves even. It says unloving. It's funny. People always talk about God is love. God is love. They say that all the time. And I agree God is love. But and yet the same people say that are so unloving. So unloving. They like no love of God. No love of His truth. And no love of His gospel. No love of their fellow man. Oh dear friends, look at how much hatred there is in our day and age among people of different races and different backgrounds. Why? Because people are unloving. And they hate God. And they hate one another. They hate His creation. It's not because of society. It's not because of inter institutionalized issues. It's because people are unloving. And they hate God. And then it says, lastly in verse 31, they are unmerciful. They do not have mercy. If you're outside of Christ, you do not have the capacity to show genuine Christian mercy. This is hopeless. This situation is utterly hopeless. The state of mankind outside of the saving grace of God is, is hopeless. And that's why Jesus had to come, was to give hopeless sinners hope. Otherwise, outside of Jesus Christ, there is no way. There is no way you could be saved, or I could be saved. In fact, if, John, if Christ had not come and died and did what He did, I couldn't stand out here and preach. For there's nothing good for me to tell you about. But nonetheless, in relation to these three verses that we just looked at, there is no hope. The sinner outside of God's grace is at total war and enmity with God, and they do not want to be near God. They would not touch Him with a 30-foot pole. Why is that? Why are we this way? Why is humankind this way? Why are we born like this? It's because man fell. In the book of Genesis, we see an account where God created the first man and first woman, Adam and Eve, and He put them in the garden. And He allowed them to eat out of any uh, tree that they wanted. But there's one tree in the center of the garden he, for he forbid them eating from. And they ended up eating from it because Satan tempted them to eat from it and they sinned. They rebelled against God's authority. And so, here we are. All of the seed of Adam and Eve. All of the seed of Adam's race. Now inherit that sinful nature that Adam and Eve took upon themselves when they rebelled against God. When Adam and Eve chose to rebel against God, we all fell as well. And we all have the consequences for that. You may say that's not fair. Well, that's how it is. You may say, it's not fair that we have to bear the penalty for someone else's action, but we do it all the time. We bear, people's, we bear people's penalties all the time for things that they do. It may not be, we may not like that, but that's how the world is. And so when Adam and Eve fell, all mankind fell with them. It says in Romans 5.12, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. We're this way because Adam sinned. The first man rebelled and he did not keep the law of God as he ought to. But you may ask, well, even further, we could con contemplate and consider, well, why? Why did God do that? Why did God test them that way? Why did God put restriction on them? Well, God is holy. God puts restriction on people, and He put restriction on Adam and Eve because He's holy. 
and he can do as he pleases. God is sovereign. He's a sovereign king of the universe. And he can command anyone to do anything that he pleases to. God has that intrinsic ability to command and we must submit. But who is this God? Who is the God of Scripture? Who is the God who created all things? Who is He? And why did He make us? Why are we here? These are deep questions, but they're all answered in Scripture. Firstly, the Bible says God is a holy God. God is a holy God. Now, that the word holy means set apart, means sanctified. You're set apart from that which is evil. And that is precisely who God is. He is set apart from all that is perverse and all that is filthy and all that is wicked. In fact, uh, in Isaiah 6, the prophet Isaiah is allowed a vision. Very rarely do any, does any of the writers of scriptures have this privilege given to them where they're able to see God. And Isaiah was one of the writers of scripture whom God allowed to have this vision. He says in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1, he says these words, In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of His robe, filling the temple. Seraphim stood above Him, each having six wings. With two He covered His face, and with two He covered His feet, and with two He flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth, is full of His glory. That is a beautiful description of the character of God. He is absolutely perfect in all His ways. He is morally good. He is morally set apart from that which is evil. And that's great. That causes great fear for those who are evil, those who are wicked, because God is not wicked and God is perfect. God is gracious and compassionate. He is abounding in loving kindness. I never want to negate that concerning God's character. God is love. He is the demonstra He is, excuse me, the perfect definition of what love is. He defines it. But that never takes away from his holiness and his purity and his righteousness and his justice. Never, never do those things negate the others. His attributes are in beautiful agreement to one another. They define the others. They define one another. Friends, this is the beauty of God. He is glorious. This is what Scripture means when it talks about God's glory. His weightiness, who He is. This is what makes God, God. Some other attributes of God. He is sovereign. The whole world is in His control. He is perfect. As I mentioned, He is a just judge. He judges the wicked. He punishes rightly. He's always doing that which is right. Always. He never, never compromises justice, but He upholds it perfectly all the time. Psalm 119, 137 reads, Righteous are You, O Lord, and upright are Your judgments. The righteous God of glory is just. He is a just God. Praise God that He is just. Praise God that He is it would be a scary thing to have a God who is unjust. He would arbitrarily punish sinners and sometimes He would arbitrarily let those who deserve punishment go. But no, Scripture says God is just. And God in His, His perfection and in His holiness did something a very long time ago. He gave us His law, His Ten Commandments. And those of you perhaps who have grown up in church or grown up in a religious setting with Judeo-Christian values perhaps are familiar with some, maybe all of these commands that God gave. The law of God is, is there for a specific purpose. And it is a twofold purpose. It shows us two things. God's law, you could say, my friends, is, is like a mirror. 
And it reflects to us two images. One, it shows us God's character. God's law shows us who He is. Just consider God's commands for a moment. God Himself said, you shall not lie. Why is that? Because God is not a liar. God is not a man that He should lie. Nor a son of man that He should repent. In fact, uh, the book of Hebrews tells us God cannot lie. What's another command that God gave? Well, in Exodus 20, another command that God gave is God said you shall not steal. can't take something that's someone else's. Why does God say that? It is because God is not a thief. God is not a thief. And therefore, He does not condone thievery. A third command that God gave is He says, You shall not commit murder, which is referenced here in Romans 1 as we're considering and contemplating this passage. It's considered, it's put there in Romans 1 toward the end as we just read. Murder. God is not a murderous God. That's why God says you shall not murder. It's not just rare, it's not just random commands that He just came up with. These are things that show us His perfection. The beauty of God, who He is. His moral perfection. He's flawless. He's a flawless God. In fact, the psalmist said, Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like the God of Scripture? There is no God like the God of Scripture, Yahweh Elohim, the God who created all things. Another command God gave, He says, You shall not commit adultery. Why did God say that? Because God is a faithful covenant-keeping God. He never abandons His promises. He never abandons His people, but He keeps them forever. And so when God says to spouses, you shall not commit adultery, it's because He is perfect in His faithfulness. And so He requires of spouses to be faithful to one another because He's perfect. That's why. <coughs> See, the law of God shows us His perfection, who He is. Those are just four commands. Just four Four of the Ten Commandments. Six more we could consider. Six more we could contemplate. But time would flee from us way too quickly. And time is of the essence. Secondly, the law of God shows us the character of man in light of the character of God. It shows us who man is. What is... How am I truly in the eyes of God? Well, as we've already seen from this passage, bad, very bad, very evil... Very perverse and wicked. And so the commands of God, the law of God shows us how we are wicked. Well, he said not to lie, but what do we do? We lie. And we have lied. God says you shall not steal. We have stolen and we steal. God says you shall not commit murder. You may say, well, I have never committed murder. Well, if you've had an abortion, that's murder. Or if you have not had an abortion, as we said, as, I, as we just considered earlier, as we contemplated the passage out of Matthew 5 where Jesus likens anger. If you have anger in your heart towards someone else, unjustified anger, sinful anger, you are a murderer in the eyes of God. God sees the heart and He sees the mind. God sees the lusts of the heart and mind. That leads us to the next thing. God says you shall not commit adultery. You ever committed adultery? You've sinned against God. You may say, I've never have. I've been faithful to my spouse. I've been faithful to my boyfriend. I've been faithful to my girlfriend. You may say that, but listen to what the command says. Jesus said in Matthew 5, He said, if you look with lust, if you look at someone else with sexual desire, who's not your spouse, you commit adultery in the heart. God, again, God sees the heart. He sees the mind and He sees you're perverse. He sees you've sinned against Him and you deserve punishment for your sin. I could go through more commands that God gave. The Sabbath day, God said you shall rest on the Sabbath. People are addicted to work. They idolize their work and so they do not, do not rest on the Sabbath. That's another command that's often forgotten. But we ask ourselves, okay, because God is a just judge and He's given His law, what is His punishment? If He's a judge and He judges, judges administer punishment. If someone murders someone else here in, in Lawrence County, South Carolina, which is where this rest area is situated, 
someone murders someone else, they have to be thrown in prison. That's the punishment for breaking the law. So with God, what is His punishment? What is God's punishment for breaking His law? Well, concisely put, it is hell. It is hell. Hell is a real place, friends. And I come out here because I care for you enough to tell you that. And I care for you enough to warn you so that you don't go. I love you and don't want you to perish in your sins. I don't want you, don't die in your sins, friends. But consider the word of the gospel. Consider the gospel of peace. The gospel of Jesus Christ. God's punishment for sin is hell. And the there is no greater place to go in all of Scripture to, to hear teaching on hell than Jesus Christ. Because Jesus spoke about hell more than any other person in all Scripture. He spoke about hell even more than He spoke about heaven. One of the things He said about hell is in Matthew 25, 46. In verse 46 of Matthew 25, He says these words... He's speaking here about those who are outside of Christ, those who are lost. He says, These will go away into eternal punishment. Hell is something that lasts forever. It is a place of punishment, torment, agony. It is an eternal flame. It is a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. Hell is real, friends. It's a real place. The fires are stoked. The flames are ready to consume the wicked. It's described as the bottomless pit. It's the place that was prepared for the devil and his angels. In fact, Jesus described it just a few verses back in verse 41. He says, Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. Hell is an eternal flame. It's a place that you do not want to go. And I certainly don't want you to go there. Oh, dear friends... Let the sobriety of this moment grip you. Let the sobriety of this reality grip you. This is a sober truth. This is, this is a heart-wrenching reality that many are going here to the place of destruction. How do we know that? Jesus said in Matthew 7. In Matthew 7, 13, He said, Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it. The way to hell is a wide path and a wide road. And many are going there. Most people are going there. I don't want you to go to hell. I don't. I don't want you to... Do not, please, my dear friends, do not die in your sins. Do not lose your soul for your sins and endure eternal hellfire for them but be saved through Jesus Christ. We're hopeless. We're without any hope. We're without any, any consolation in and of ourselves. We have nothing to say before God because we have nothing good in, in and of ourselves. Just as a murderer has nothing to say before a judge, a convicted murderer here in Lawrence County has nothing to say before a judge concerning his own goodness because it does not matter in a court of law. It's about his guilt. And it is the same way with God. It does not matter how many good things you've done in your life. You have guilt before God. And even your good things are not good. So in the eyes of God, you've sinned, you've sinned, you've sinned. You're wicked. And you deserve His punishment. We are without hope, friends. I'm without hope. Apart from the saving grace of Jesus Christ. And that leads me now to present the Gospel. Now that there has been a thorough covering of the bad news, there can be a glorious unveiling of the good. Dear friends, the second person of the Trinity, eternal God Almighty, Jesus Christ came into this world and took upon flesh, was born of a virgin, born under the law, and He kept that law that we broke. All of those commands that God gave, Jesus Christ fulfilled them. Think about the glory of Christ that He would lay aside the worship of angels as He was there in heaven with the Father for all eternity being worshipped by the angels in heaven. Yet He came down to earth to redeem a sinful people. He came and fulfilled those commands that we ourselves have trampled underfoot. 
He fulfilled the law of God. Jesus said in Matthew 5.17, Do not think that I came to abolish the law of the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. And He did that. He fulfilled the law. How do we know that? Matthew 3. Just a, two chapters back, Matthew 3.17. This is right after Jesus was baptized and He comes up out of the water. And God the Father speaks audibly from heaven. And listen to the, what the Father says. It says, And behold, a voice out of the heaven said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Jesus Christ is the only man who could please God. You and I cannot please God. You and I are sinners in the hands of an angry God. You and I are depraved and wicked. We have broken His law, but Christ comes and fulfills it. And then He goes, and He is beat and He is whipped. He willingly lays down Himself as a lamb to be beat and to be spat upon, even abandoned by His own disciples. And He's nailed to a cross and He's hanging there on that cross for those hours. And He cries out as He's hanging there. And He says, Eloi, Eloi, lama shabakathani. That's Aramaic for, My God, My God, why have You forsaken Me? On that cross, something was happening which the people who were there could not see. Something spiritual was happening. And it was this, the Father was unleashing His wrath upon His Son. What is hell, my friends? What is hell? It is God unleashing His wrath upon the wicked. We deserve God's wrath for sin. We deserve to be crushed under God's wrath eternally. But instead of doing that, God poured out His wrath on His Son for His people. God poured out His justice on His Son. So that sinners like you and me could live. Isaiah 53, listen to this. This was written 700 years before Jesus was born. Seven centuries before Jesus' parents were even alive. Listen to what it says. Verse 4. Surely our griefs He Himself bore and our sorrows He carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed Him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon Him and by His scourging we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to His own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on Him. He was oppressed and He was afflicted. Yet He did not open His mouth like a lamb that is led to slaughter, and like a sheep that is silent before its shearers, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people, to whom the stroke was due. And then listen to verse 10. But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. Jesus Christ on that cross was treated as if He was a sinner, was treated as if He was a liar and a thief and an adulterer, though He was perfect. That's the glory of the Gospel, friends. That's the beauty of the Gospel of Jesus Christ. That He satisfied the demands of God's law. He, just, he satisfied God's judgment. If someone murders someone else here in Lawrence County and they stand before a judge, they have to go to prison for murdering someone else. They have to. They have to be thrown in prison for having murdered someone else. That's only just. The judge is only just in doing that. And it's the same way with God. When you sin against God, it is only just that He would throw you into hell. But listen to this. A judge can do this. He can call up his son and say, Son, I want you to sell your house and sell your car and sell everything you own and sell yourself into slavery and give up everything you own and buy this man's pardon. Buy the bail. Pay the fine for his sin. Pay the, pay the bail to let him free. And the guilty, convicted murderer can leave the courtroom and be forgiven. And the justice of the law has been satisfied. That is the cross of Jesus Christ. That God, his son, God sent His Son to pay the bail, to pay the fine for our sin, so God can legally and justly dismiss the case. He can say to the sinner, I will not judge you because my Son was judged for you. That's the beauty of the Gospel of Jesus Christ. And three days later, He was raised from the dead. Christ rose from the grave. And that shows us that He is Lord. That shows us He is God. That shows us He is the King of glory. And that He has the power to save those even if they die. He has the power to save those when they die. Even those who believe upon Him. 
He has the power to save. It was a public display that God had received His sacrifice, that it truly paid for our sin. Listen to what Jesus said in, in John chapter 11, verse 25. He says these words, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. If you believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ, you will live even if you die. Forty days later, he continued to minister among his disciples. And then he went up to the Mount of Olives and he ascended into glory. He went up into heaven bodily and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He sat down. It's done. The work of salvation is finished. You want peace with God? It's done. It's been bought already through Jesus Christ. He sat down at the right hand of God's throne and He is seated there now. And He is the King. He is the King. No other ruler trumps His rule and His authority. No other, no other president, no other prime minister, no other dictator. He is king. He is Lord. And this is His world and His universe. And He has, think about this, the King who made everything, who made the whole world and the birds of the air and the grass of the field and the trees and you and gives you everything you have. The King stepped down and became some poor carpenter in the middle of Israel 2,000 years ago and lived a quiet life and then was stretched upon a cross public for all the world to see as He satisfied the demands of God's holy law. That is the beauty of the Gospel. That God humbles Himself. The Creator dying for the creation. And so my friends, my dear friends, and I call you that. I call you my friends. Not because I necessarily know you, but because I care for you. And I care for your soul to tell you this. Repent and believe the Gospel. Don't try to be a better person. Don't try and save yourself by your religious works. Don't try and please God by your performance because you can't. You can't be good enough. You'll never be good enough. Instead, what you must do is turn from your sin and believe upon Jesus Christ alone. See, my friends, your hope is either in Jesus Christ or it is in you. And you are going to fail. You're going to fail on the day of judgment if your trust is in you. But if your trust is in Jesus Christ, listen to these words out of the book of Romans. Romans chapter 10 is a precious passage. Romans 10.11 says, For the Scripture says, Whoever believes in Him will not be disappointed. If your trust is in the Lord Jesus Christ, heaven's gates fling open and you'll enter in. Your eternity is secure. No one can snatch you from His hand. The Father, no one will snatch you from the Father's hand. You'll be saved forevermore. Flee your sin, your pornography, your, your fornication, your drunkenness, your drug abuse, your selfishness. Flee your idolatry. Flee whatever you're holding to. Leave your sin. It's not worth you going to hell for all eternity just for a small season of pleasure in sin. It's not worth it. Flee your sin. Deny yourself. Take up your cross. Come after Jesus Christ. Come after Him. Believe Him alone. And God will forgive you of all your sins. Every last one of your sins. Past, present, future. It doesn't matter how evil you are or what you've done. God will forgive you. Because Jesus Christ's death is enough. It is sufficient. And God will wrap you in the righteousness of His Son. He will give you the righteousness of Christ. God will count you as having lived Jesus' life. It's an exchange. God counts Jesus as if He lived my life, and He counts me as if I lived Jesus' life. That's the beauty of the great exchange of the Gospel. That God would treat me as if He treats His Son, and He treats His Son as if He treated me. As I deserve to be treated. There's no greater deal than this. There's no greater bargain. No greater exchange. Sin for perfect righteousness. And God will look at you, 
and say, this is my beloved son, this is my beloved daughter in whom I am well pleased. Not because you did anything, not because you believed good enough, not because you repented good enough, but because Christ, His performance is good enough. His righteousness is sufficient. His death is enough. His perfect intercession is enough. It's either Christ or you. That's your choice today. Is it going to be you or Christ? Are you going to live for yourself or live for the glory of Jesus Christ? It's a free gift of eternal life. Believe it, dear friends. Believe it, my dear friends. Listen to what the Bible says in Luke 9. Following Jesus is not an easy task. Jesus Himself said in Luke 9, 23, He said it, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. Whatever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. For what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. Dear friends, deny yourself. Jesus is a self-hate guru, not a self-love guru. Don't love yourself. Hate yourself and forget about yourself and follow after Christ. Deny yourself, abhor yourself, and believe the Savior that He is able to save those who draw near to God through Him to the uttermost. And oh, my dear friends, Oh, friends, give God the glory. Give God the glory for what He has done. This is all to the glory of God. This whole economy of salvation is to bring God the honor, to exalt the Creator of all things, to glorify God. So give Him the glory. where it's all for. The whole economy of salvation. It's all of grace. All of the economy of salvation is all of God's free, unmerited grace in His Son, Jesus Christ, so that He is glorified. It is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, to the glory of God alone. Dear friends, you who are outside of Christ, I encourage you and I implore you, believe. Believe upon Christ and be saved from your sins. And if you're a Christian, you say you're a Christian at least, but you live in rebellion to the authority of Jesus Christ, you're not a Christian. Repent and believe on Him. And dear Christians, true saints of God, true holy saints, rest in this precious truth of Jesus Christ today. Be encouraged in your hearts and your minds as you think upon the Savior, Jesus Christ. Dear friends, it is glorious. Jesus Christ is the Savior. He is Lord. Philippians 2 tells us that. That He is Lord. And there is no other Lord. There is no other King but Jesus Christ. He is Kurios. He is the Sovereign One. And so, if you're a Christian, rest in this reality today. And if you're not, believe it. Place your trust in the finished work of Christ. Place your trust in the Savior or you will be lost eternally. So we've seen here in Romans chapter 1, verses 29 through 31, that those who are outside of Christ are in a horrible state, a terrifying state, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, envious, hateful. Yet Jesus Christ is a sufficient Savior. We have seen in other passages how Christ has come to save sinners from their sin. He is the way, He is the truth, and He is the life. 
and no one comes to the Father but through Him. Dear friends, I would encourage you, as I said a moment ago, to give God the glory. This is all to the glory of God. Everything has been created to bring God glory. Everything has been made to this end. Your life, my life, everything in this world, all works to that end to bring God glory. And the, especially the gospel of Jesus Christ is to the glory of God. So give Him glory. I will leave off with this text from Romans 9 in verses 3 through 5, where the Apostle Paul is talking about the Israelites. He was burdened for the Israelites to be saved. But in verse 5, he ends off with a very small doxology to Jesus Christ as Lord. He says in verse 3, For I could wish that I myself were a curse separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are the Israelites, to whom belongs the adoption of sons, and the glory, and the covenants, and the giving of the law, and the temple service, and the promises. Whose are the fathers, and from whom is the Christ according to the flesh, who is over all God blessed forever. Amen. Indeed. To Jesus Christ be all the glory forever. Amen. Amen.